go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> yeah, merciful Father, we just thank you so much that we can come to you and make our requests known. And Lord, we know that it is your will that your people be built up and edified and that your holy word would be honored in the Lord that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers. And so we just ask, even as we look at these books that you've given to us from long of old and of your ancient kings, Lord, that even through that we would see uh, our true king high and lifted up. Do pray, Lord, that you would help this next half an hour, 45 minutes to be uh, of help towards the worship service. And we ask that your spirit would put Christ before our eyes. In his name we pray, amen. Hey, good morning. I think we are in First Samuel. Uh, first and Second Samuel are one book in the original Hebrew, and so I'm going to treat them as such. I'll, I'll handle the the material obviously separately, but it. Uh, I think it is important to some extent to see it as one big book, and I believe that the, there's a bookend to the beginning of 1 Samuel and the way that 2 Samuel ends with David um, and his census. Hopefully we'll get into that, maybe not today, but nevertheless. So the book of Samuel comes from, uh, the name rather, Samuel, comes from the word that God, El, hears. And so maybe you've heard of the Shema of Israel. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one, in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and following. And so God has heard. That's what Samuel's name means. And um, if you know the character of Samuel, why would that maybe be uh, kind of punny? Anyone want to take a stab at it? Exactly. Chapter 3 of First Samuel. Your servant is listening. He hears you. He shamas you. And so you got Shmuel here, Samuel. That's his name in Hebrew. And so God is going to play with his name often in the book, as he often does with many characters, and uh, also with Saul's name. Saul's name means to ask. And so you ask for a king, I'll give you ask. That's his name. And so very fitting. And uh, Saul will not do what the Lord has asked of him at times. And so his name gets punned and used against him. And God will use these names positively and negatively along with David's, which his name means uh, beloved. So Samuel is going to record now the history of Israel in the land of Canaan as they move from the rule of judges to the rule of a monarch, of a king. And so if you remember in the book of Judges, it ended with uh, everyone did what was right in their own eyes, and uh, it was not good because there was no king in Israel. And of course, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, says that when a king does come, this is the type of king that you need. You need a king who loves righteousness, hates wickedness. Uh, your scepter, O God, is forever. Everything that Psalm 45 says concerning a king, uh, that's what they should look for. And um, that's not how it's going to go down here at the beginning. And nevertheless, God is going to give them such a king who isn't without his flaws, and he isn't Jesus. But nevertheless, um, who is going to be the king that is going to lead the people away from, in particular, their idols? Remember, the first four of the Ten Commandments have to do with idolatry, because that is, um, that's Israel's pet sin. That's the one they keep going back to. And it's really the one that manifests their unbelief in a, just a really overt way. Because if you're going to go to other idols for your crops and your, your fertility and these kind of things, you just simply don't trust that God, you just don't believe God is trustworthy and that his word is enough. And so who's going to be the king that actually puts the idols away from Israel? And David is going to be that king. It's going to be the heyday of Israel uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 5 to 8 to 9, and yet it still will not obviously be enough. Um, so that's where we're going. Samuel emerges as the last judge, and he's going to anoint the first two kings, Saul and David. And he's going to chronicle the rise and fall of both of them. And of course, 
if you just read First and Second Samuel, um, you could just do a great character study between the two kings and see. At times, actually, David, he also is, he doesn't, he's got some dark stains in his life. And yet how he responds in true repentance and ultimately God's election will stand. Um, he has chosen Saul in his wrath and he gives Saul a legitimate opportunity to be the king. And, um, well, we'll see how it goes. All right, the book begins... like the call of Abraham, with a, with a barren woman. And uh, her name is Hannah. And uh, Hannah is going to be married to a man whose name is Elkanah, and uh, he has another wife whose name is Penina. And she irritates. It reminds us again of uh, some of the patriarch stories, right? A lot of the patriarchs, um, there's... Um, infertility, and there's um, rival wives in the, in the case of Jacob. And again, so it just kind of instantly makes you think of Israel's history and how they came to be as a nation. And these stories uh, are very purposeful because God will bring salvation through the woman and in situations that look simply as good as dead, this being no different. Um, there's jealousy in the, in the beginning, you know, the rival Penina is just really brutal to this woman and uh, provokes her bitterly. And so if you know the story, you probably do. Hannah is weeping at the, it's interesting. It says that she's weeping at the temple doorpost. But the interesting thing about that is there's no temple yet. Uh, it doesn't exist until 2 Samuel. And so uh, this, is, this is what's called an anachronism. In the Bible, sometimes the Bible will take something that will come later or something that came before and just place it there to make a point to kind of see uh, the overarching themes together and doesn't want you to divorce. It's not like the Bible is lying to you, but it's just taking what was then the place of worship. We're just going to call it the temple here. And I think that's purposeful for how Second Samuel ends. And like I said, there's a bookend going on. Um, I'll probably mention that later. Nevertheless, she's distressed. She is um, pouring out her heart to the Lord, and um, she basically makes a vow to the Lord that if he should give her a, a child, a son, that she'll dedicate him uh, with a Nazarite vow, and a, and a razor shall never come on his head, just like um, Samson. And the priest is the, is the individual who sees her doing this and pouring her heart, heart out, and of course her, her lips are moving, but she is... Uh, not making a noise, so she actually he actually thinks she's intoxicated, and he charges her with being drunk, and uh, he's totally mistaken. It's interesting, actually, once you get to the book of Acts, do you have something similar? Yeah, when they start prophesying in tongues and the Spirit comes, these men are drunk, but they're mistaken. The, the, the Spirit of God has come upon them, and same with this woman. Uh, her prayer and in particular, her dedication to the Lord and her willingness to not just, she doesn't just want a child, but she's just, she wants God to come through for her because she's willing to part with the child. And that's actually what's going to happen. And the Lord is going to come through in a just wonderful deliverance and give her Samuel uh, because she has asked him of the Lord. There's, uh, there's Saul's name right there. And because the Lord has heard her, she will name him. The Lord has heard me, basically. Or God has heard me. And then Hannah's uh, song of thanksgiving, her prayer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to argue that it, it is the thematic, like the program for the entire book. And so if you've ever read Hannah's song or Hannah's prayer, um, it, is, it is really deep. And it's all about the Messiah that is to, to come. She's going to say, he will exalt the horn of his anointed, which of course anointed is the concept of a Messiah. It's the word Mashiach. And that is how her prayer ends. Does anybody know who basically has, who quotes Hannah's song verbatim in the New Testament? Mary, Mary the mother of, of our Lord. Exactly. Mary's Magnificat is almost word for word Hannah's prayer. And in particular, if you have your Bible open, it, it'd be helpful to see this in chapter two. It's a, it's a chiasm. It's, it's very beautiful. In the center of it, is, is in verses 6 and 7. <clears throat> and 
And this is the theme for the book. The Lord kills and makes alive. The Lord brings down to Sheol and raises up. There's resurrection theme. The Lord makes poor and rich. He brings low and he exalts. And so this entire book is going to show these situations that are as good as dead, where the Lord brings something down to the pit and then he revives it. And also those who act haughtily or in arrogance, God will humble them and knock them down a few pegs. And uh, he will raise up those who humble themselves. And even in the life of Saul, we're going to see this uh, in a positive sense at the beginning. Saul starts off really, really wonderfully. He is a humble man. He is wise. He's selfless in some ways and altruistic. But, and he, things go well for him when he is that way. But ultimately, he acts in arrogance and he seizes things that he shouldn't do. And, uh, well, so will David, and there will be consequences for those things. So I, I think that this is the theme of the book, that God will humble the proud and he will exalt the humble. We see this in, anybody know any other New Testament books? Peter, another one. James, chapter 4. Humble yourself. Under the mighty hand of God, all that, that's Peter. But both, both general epistles have this, um, have this idea of humbling oneself so God will exalt them at the proper time. And so that's how the book will go. And in her prayer, especially towards the end there, in verse 10, it says this. Those who contend with the Lord will be shattered. Against them he will thunder. Now the ironic thing about that is, it's very poetic, that's the word. It's a rare word that's used in this book. It's the same word that's used uh, concerning Penina irritating and provoking her. So she says, I'm being thundered against, but the Lord will thunder against those who are proud. And so here's this woman who's prophesying and praying and, uh, and singing to the Lord from her own situation. And she's clearly got Penina in mind when she's saying that the Lord will humble the arrogant and God's going to take that, as he does with all the different, the naming of the tribes of Israel in Genesis 29 and 30. He's going to take that and put a prophetic spin on it and, uh, and go even well beyond the intention of the person who first said it. And so, thunder in the heavens will the Lord against those who are proud and arrogant. And that's actually what's going to happen here in chapter 7. Um, I, I, I'll get to how the buildup comes, but chapter 7 is a highlight, is a high point of uh, the call of Samuel, because it's in this chapter where Israel comes to their senses, at least momentarily, and they realize we need to put our idols away. The Lord is the Lord. The reason why we're in such distress, which I'll get to is in the chapters in between, is because we don't trust the Lord, we haven't repented, and uh, these idols are a big problem, and Samuel tells them as much, and so they repent. And then what God does is he thunders, the same word is used, against his enemies to fulfill her very song here in, uh, in chapter 2. And uh, those are the Philistines, and God will give victory over them. Now, how did it get to be that the Philistines are such a problem here? Well, let's back it up. A big theme in Samuel, especially in 1 Samuel, is the theme of true and false worship. Who are going to be the true worshipers of God? And uh, Hannah is a great example. Yeah, she might look drunk to the priest, but he's not so hot of a character either. He doesn't rebuke his sons. Their names are Hophni and Phinehas. And uh, Hophni and Phinehas are uh, just rebels. They are men who work at the temple. Again, temple doesn't exist yet. They work at the sacrificial system place here at the tent. And... Um, not only do they take from the food of the offering that they shouldn't take, and they seize it by force, they also fornicate with the women who come to the temple, to the tent of meeting. And so God is exceedingly upset about this, that his leaders don't take the worship seriously, and beyond that, they defile themselves and the sacrifice and dishonor God. And God's going to take this theme and say to Eli, who's their father, 
who should rebuke his sons, but he doesn't, that your sons have dishonored me and I will dishonor them. And that's this word here for, comes from the word glory or honor or heavy. It's all the same word. It's the same word that's used in uh, the book of Exodus where God uses Moses' heavy tongue to bring honor and glory to himself. He puns that. He's going he's gonna to pun this word throughout this section as well. And so if you dishonor me, I will dishonor you and I will bring heaviness against you. And uh, that will be fulfilled in chapter 4. And he says, I'm going to raise up a faithful priest over all my house. And in the immediate context, it's probably Samuel, but goes beyond and, uh, and beyond probably to the priest of Zadok and even beyond that ultimately to the Lord Jesus. Then we get the call of Samuel in chapter 3 here. And um, Brother Kurt already alluded to it. You know, three times the Lord calls Samuel. He goes to Eli, and um, there's the whole interplay of the Lord, I'm listening, and eventually he's called as a prophet. So not only is he a priest, you know, right, he's working with Eli at this time. His mother gave him up to the service of the Lord, but he's also going to have a prophetic office. So he's going to be judge, priest, and prophet all kind of um, simultaneously. And so Samuel is the forerunner for the king. He kind of serves in a John the Baptist type way, preparing the way for the Lord, preparing the way for the king. Um, he's an awesome character, but he's going to have his flaws too. Nevertheless, the story continues, and in chapter 4, the Philistines, uh, in fulfillment of the word against Eli and his sons, take the ark. Really big deal. Remember, the ark is where the tablets are, the rod of Aaron is, the manna, and all these special reminders of God's faithfulness in the midst of Israel's evil. And of course, it is the footstool of God. This is where, <clears throat> you know, in the, in the Holy of Holies, God would meet once a year in a unique, special, profound way, uh, you know, create smoke. So the ark is taken, and Israel is distressed, Eli in particular, and yes, the word concerning Hophni and Phinehas comes true, and they die in battle. Now, the word here gets punned because um, Eli is a fat man. He was old and heavy. That's the same word for dishonor. That's that word kavod. And so the heavy man falls backwards, breaks his neck, and um, what comes about is this woman who was the wife of Phineas, she hears her husband's dead. Eli cares more that the ark is gone. He dies, and uh, she gives birth. I think she dies too, if I'm not mistaken, in childbirth. And she names her child. Anybody know? Ichabod. Ichavod. There's that name. No glory. No heaviness. Because the glory of God has departed because the ark is taken away. So it's a really big deal. The ark is gone. The Philistines have it. What is going to happen? And in just a mystery of mysteries, just like um, Eli fell backwards and broke his neck, the Philistine god Dagon also has his head chopped off, as it were, because God is working against the Philistines and he's making a point. Uh, this is not your ark. And he's working against them. And it says the hand of the Lord was heavy, same word, against the Ashdodites, which is the Philistines. And he continues to heavily bring plagues against them. And um, they want to now give glory, same word, kavod, to the God of Israel. And uh, they're not supposed to harden their hearts, same word. All these words get punned throughout. It reminds you of the Exodus. God is working against Israel's enemy despite their disobedience, which is, again, it's this second Exodus kind of uh, motif but what ends up happening is the Philistines actually show more reverence to some extent for the ark than even Israel does because they, they just want to get it out of there. They just want to bring it back. They put it in their cart. They shouldn't do that, but they don't know any better. And they, they take these cows and they put, on, they put the ark on this cart and they basically, if the cows go back to Israel, they know that God is God. And uh, that's what ends up happening. Now, the very sad thing about it is the ark ends up coming back to a place called Beth Shemesh, which means house of the sun. And um, 
the people who are there who look into it are, uh, are those, Beth, she- Beth Shemesh is a place where priests lived. And so the priests who should know better, again, just like Eli's sons, they should know better. They look inside the ark to see what's happened and many, many of them die. And they say, who is able to stand before the Lord, this holy God? This will happen again in 2 Samuel, something very similar by the, an am, a man by the name of Uzzah, who also should know better than to touch the ark. And we see the holiness of God on full display, again, for those who should know better and don't worship the Lord properly and abuse it, the, the means of grace, and don't venerate God as the holy God that he is, he acts quite severely at times. And, um, but again, right after this, God comes through in this beautiful way and saves his people and calls them to repentance. That's, the, that's sort of the section on Samuel. The next section is the rise and fall of Saul. How are we doing for time here? Oh, boy. So chapter 8 begins with uh, Israel desiring a king because Samuel is now old. And the sad thing about Samuel is his own sons are not good people either. And so the people are quite frustrated because they recognize that Samuel's boys will not make good judges like he was. And so they want a king. So the first reason is, is not a bad reason. Like it's, they're, they're right that Samuel's sons are not good men. But the second reason that they just want to make a king after the nations, which is exactly what they say, appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. That's where they go wrong. Because they're supposed to look for a king that follows the precepts of Deuteronomy chapter 17, who walks in the ways of the Lord, who meditates on his law day and night, but they would rather look to a king who is like the nations. And so Samuel warns them. Well, first of all, God says, listen, that's Samuel's name, hearken to the voice of the people and give them what they ask. And like I said, there's the pun, because he's going to give them exactly what they ask for. So listen to them. And he warns them, look, this king is going to enslave you. It won't go well for you. Uh, He's going to take the best of your crops. He's going to take your children and all these different things. He's going to tax you very heavily. And uh, they say, we don't care. Uh, We want a king like the nations. And so as the story goes on, you know that he finds Saul, who is looking for some donkeys from his daddy's donkeys. And uh, eventually Samuel says, don't worry about the donkeys. Uh, We got more important business to do here. Um, And he's going to anoint him as the first king. And like I said, Saul starts off quite well. Um, he's actually quite scared. He hides behind the baggage when the lot reveals that he's, um, he's the man, he's the king. And uh, the people are not impressed by this. The people look at Saul and they, you know, yeah, yeah, he's head and shoulders above the rest, but it's still like, who is this guy? And so some of the rabble uh, speak against him and they say, how can this person deliver us? And they despised him. And they didn't bring him any present. And yet, here's where Saul does well. He doesn't, he doesn't speak out. He keeps silent. And he remains humble for the time. Now, what ends up happening is there is an, an, an oath. There's a covenant that ends up being rejected right after this ceremony with the lot. And the king of the Ammonites, his name is Nahash, which means serpent. So the serpent comes about and says, let's make a deal. Uh, you guys covenant with me, I'll leave you alone, but you just got to gouge out your right eyes and it'll be a stain on Israel. And so Israel says, give us some time to think about it. And Saul says, ain't no way that this is going to happen. And the spirit of the Lord comes upon him and uh, in a violent rushing way, again, that doesn't mean that he's regenerated, that he's a person of faith. God in the Old Testament would come upon people in just uh, unique ways at times. They could prophesy They could do valiant acts by the Spirit. doesn't mean they're people of faith. But nevertheless, Saul comes and he takes a yoke of oxen, cuts them in pieces, and he sends the word out. And the dread of the Lord falls upon the people. And they go and win this battle against the Ammonites. And then everyone starts to praise Saul, like he's our man. And again, Saul doesn't 
take vengeance because they say, look at, remember the guys that didn't honor you and they despised you and they spoke out against you? Hack them up, Saul. And Saul says, no, today is a day of celebration. We're not gonna do that. So everything's going really well. Saul looks humble, isn't vindictive, knows his place. And then right in the center here is one of the, again, just one of those beautiful chapters of God's faithfulness. And he says, he gives them a chance. He, he, he speaks to them through Samuel. And he says to the people, behold, I have listened to your voice. Again, that's Samuel's name. I have shemad you. And I gave you what you asked for, even though you didn't ask for it rightly. I still listen to you. And now, even though you rebelled against me, and even though you don't want a king for the right purposes, I'm still going to come to you and offer to you mercy because now, the, basically, the onus is on you, people. It's congregationalism right here. You keep your king in check, even as he keeps you in check. You're both responsible for one another. You're responsible for the leadership, and the leadership is responsible for you. And you've done this great evil says Samuel through, obviously God speaking through him. But then these words come, do not fear. You have committed all this evil, which right away is like, how, how can you even say that? Do not fear. You have committed all this evil. That's why they should fear. And yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. So by faith and repentance, God will welcome them. Already in the Old Testament, yes, you are a very guilty people, I'm here to offer you mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment, which is, again, another theme of First and Second Samuel, especially Second Samuel. And so the people uh, want to respond this way, and um, the offer's on the table. Keep the king in check. He's to keep you in check. That's when everything goes down pretty quickly, downhill. So this is a continuous war with the Philistines, and um, Samuel was telling... Saul, that he needs to wait seven days before he offers, well, he needs to wait for him to come so he can offer the sacrifice. And uh, Saul starts getting panicky, as we're prone to do when we're looking, people are, are getting fussy, and uh, people are starting to complain and getting rambunctious. And he says, well, man, forget it. Let me just do the sacrifice. I don't have time to wait for Samuel anymore. And that's misplay number one. Because here we go, worship the worship of God is once again not taken seriously. It's not for him to do that. It's only the priest's job to offer the sacrifices. And so Saul, by priestly usurpation, just like Eli's sons earlier, uh, seizes something that he shouldn't seize, and he makes excuses about it. And eventually, obviously, Samuel shows up right when he's doing it, and God says, now because of this, you will not get a dynasty. You will not have sons who will inherit the kingdom, uh, you're a one and done. But he doesn't say that he, he has to stop being king. He just won't have a dynasty. And so the story continues, and we see Saul act more and more rashly, and really his true colors come out. In the next chapter, they're in the midst of war. His people are tired and weary, and then he doubles down in what looks like religious zeal, but it's not. It's, it's folly. It's a foolish oath. Once again, foolish vows all over the place. And he says, nobody eats today until we win the battle or else they die. Now, Jonathan, his son, is out and about with his armor bearer. He never heard this oath. And so they're out and about and he eats some honey and word gets back and he, he's guilty, right? He broke the oath unknowingly, but it was a foolish vow. He shouldn't have made that oath like Jephthah is stupid. Why are you doing that? And these people are rushing and eating blood and awful leadership, and the people end up interceding for Jonathan. He doesn't die, but it's another stain on, on Saul's ministry or kingship, whatever you want to call it, where we see that he acts very rashly. He, he's not a person who seeks the Lord, who waits for the Lord, who goes to him. So strike two. Strike three is going to be, well, this is where we'll end is going to be the next chapter in, in chapter 15 where the people go out against the Amalekites. And if you remember, the Amalekites are the people who 
um, already in the, in the Exodus story are rivals of Israel. And um, remember the story with Moses and his hands need to be lifted up by Joshua and her. And when his hands are up, they win. And when they're down, they're not winning. So this is the same people. And God has set his sword against the Amalekites. And he says, their time is done. No more Amalekites. Kill them all. Their king is named Agag. And so partial, dis- partial obedience ends up bro- proving to be disobedience because they do end up beating the Malachites, but they save some of the spoil and, they don't, and he doesn't kill the king. And Saul makes excuses for this again. He's like, I did listen to the Lord. This is, this is what it says in 1519. Uh, Samuel comes up to him again. Why did you not obey the Lord? This is Samuel's name. Why did you not listen you rushed upon the spoil and what was the evil and, and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then Saul said to Samuel, I did listen to the voice of the Lord. No, you didn't. I have brought back Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people, look at Adam shifting to the woman, took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest things of the devoted uh, matter to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. It's like, we're just going to put a religious twist on this. It's like, we did it for the Lord. It's like, yeah, but when the Lord asks you to do something explicitly and you don't listen, you can have, you can make all sorts of pious excuses. Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed, that is, Shema, Samuel, than the fat of rams. Rebellion is as divination, insubordination, as idolatry. And so from this point forward, the jig is up for Saul. Saul will no longer get to be king, or at the very least, yeah, his kingdom is going to be given to another better than him. And Samuel tells him this. And you see what Saul does? Here's a, here's a great picture of the contrast between Saul and David. When Saul hears it, he grabs Samuel's robe and he seizes it. And he says to him, honor me in front of the people. I, I, I'm sorry. Just bring me back to that honor. The first time we had that meal in front of the elders. I love that. Give it back to me. And he says, you just tore my robe, God will tear the kingdom from you. And you want honor, just like Hophni and Phinehas, you will, you will get the heaviness of God and the judgment, and God will be glorified through your destruction, ultimately. And so Saul, the sad story of Saul, Samuel has to come and hack Agag, the king, to pieces. And clearly, we read along in the story, and the Agagites, the Amalekites, are not ultimately done away with once you get to the book of Esther, an Agagite named Haman is still on the scene, and he causes nothing but grief for the people of Israel. So if Saul would have done his job, uh, that wouldn't have ended up happening. Nevertheless, um, the story, this, the difference between Saul and David is he tears the robe of Samuel. He takes it because he wants honor. And when David has Saul in a cave, and he has him right where he wants him, couldn't ask for a better scenario. He's just leaning up against the wall, going to the bathroom. And he takes just a corner of his robe and instantly he's cut to the heart. It's like, I shouldn't have done that. That's still the Lord's anointed. And so here you have a person who seizes the robe versus a person that regrets instantly by just touching it. And there's the heart of the two individuals, one of faith and repentance, what we'll see in David, and one of it looks like repentance. He's kind of selling repentance. He has all sorts of religious excuses. But you'd really look at Saul's life. You're like, that's not a repentant man. That's not a man of faith. He doesn't care about the honor of Yahweh. He cares more about of his own honor. And so he will be rejected. And from this point forward, the story shifts to the boy from Jesse who will rise up and um, be on the run from this, this king who at first loves him, but we don't have time for that today. So let's go to prayer. Father, we just thank you so much 
that you've given us a true king. Lord, we just pray that we would be people who truly worship you in spirit and in truth, rightly. And we do pray, Lord, that you would uh, grant us the same, no, even more, Lord, we know that you will, more mercy than even that you showed this people who acted wickedly. We thank you that your mercy is more and that it triumphs over judgment in your severity, Lord, and that your kindness leads us to repentance. So we just ask as we go to prayer now, Lord, that you would make that to be at the forefront of our minds, that we confess our sins to one another, that we might be healed, and that you would be greatly esteemed as the holy God of Israel.